Okay, this is giving a lot of people trouble, so it's being done out of order and then will be reposted in order. So this is quiz 16, CPL article 220. Which of the following are true regarding kinds of pleas that may be entered to an indictment? And all of the above are valid as a study question, you just gotta memorize them. The defendant may, as a matter of right, enter a plea of not guilty to the entire indictment. The defendant may, as a matter of right, enter a plea of guilty to the entire indictment unless the indictment charges murder in the first degree. Now, when we come to the next couple of things, the DA has to be involved and the court has to be involved. So now we're looking for permission of the court and consent of the people when we're talking about a plea bargain or not responsible by reason of mental disease or defect. With permission of the court and consent of the people, defendant may enter a plea of guilty to a lesser included offense or guilty to some charges and not guilty to other charges. That literally is the definition of a plea bargain. With respect to mental disease or defect, it's with permission of the court and consent of the people, the defendant may enter a plea of not responsible by reason of mental disease or defects under certain conditions. There's a few things the court has to do. So all of those were bad. Where the indictment charges a class A felony other than a drug felony or charges a class B violent felony offense, which is also an armed felony, then a plea of guilty must include at least a plea of guilty to a class C violent felony offense. So I'm going to get into these more as I go on and, and give you ways to help memorize it. For now, just know armed felony, be violent, has to be a plea to at least class C violent. Which of the following statements are false regarding pleas to an indictment when the defendant is a juvenile or adolescent offender? When an adolescent offender takes a plea to an offense constituting a misdemeanor, the plea shall be deemed replaced by a juvenile delinquency fact-finding determination and the action shall be removed to family court. If an adolescent offender takes a plea to an offense constituting a felony, the court may remove the action to family court in accordance with 722. It's very, very different if you have an adolescent offender taking a plea constituting a felony versus a plea to a misdemeanor. One is an automatically deemed replaced by JD fact-finding determination and automatically removed to family court. The other one, it's about court's discretion. C, a 13-year-old defendant charged with murder in the second degree can only plead to a designated felony act. That is a gift question if they give it to you. Please don't get it wrong. If the indictment charges a 14 or 15-year-old with murder in the second degree, the plea must be to a charge defendant is criminally responsible for. And remember, it's the age of the crime that was committed that's controlling. So if they committed the crime, that's the age you're going to be looking at when they did it. E, if the district attorney wishes to have a case against a juvenile offender removed to family court, he shall submit a subscribed memorandum setting forth a recommendation that the interest of justice would be served by removal of the action family court. However, this procedure is only available if murder in the second degree charge is committed by a 13 year old. So there is a special procedure about removing the action of family court. There's a charge of murder in the second degree that's only possible, even with the DA doing this memorandum and everything, if the, the JD is a 13 year old. It's not available for juvenile offenders who are 14, 15 year old charged with murder in the second degree. A defendant is entering a plea of guilty to an indictment that charges murder in the first degree. You need permission of the court, consent of the prosecutor. There must be an agreed upon sentence of imprisonment. The sentence must be life imprisonment without parole or a sentence other than life in prison without parole. And the reason that they say it like that is because if they ever change the sentence to include a sentence that's something other than life in prison without parole, then they don't have to update this section. When you're talking about a serious offense, like a class B felony, like rape first degree, criminal sexual act first degree, those are serious offenses. The factors that the DA has to show has got to be one of these. And it's mitigating circumstances which bear directly on the way the crime is committed. If defendant was not the only one who participated in the crime, that their role was relatively minor, but not minor enough to constitute a defense. Possible deficiencies in the proof. If their person had no JD adjudications of having committed his designated felony act, that it's not a pattern of criminal behavior and is not likely to be repeated. So just one of those has to be alleged. So remember, this question is specifically about when the DA has to file the memorandum 
saying one of those factors because of the type of charge it is. Now we're moving on to the courts agreeing with the DA and wants to go along with removing the case to family court. So what does the court have to do? Specify on the record which portions of the memorandum it's relying on as the basis of its opinion. The court must state on the record that it believes the interest of justice would be served by removal. The defendant will be permitted to enter a plea that they're not criminally responsible for due to infancy. The plea shall be deemed a JD fact-finding determination and the court thereupon must direct the action be removed to family court. Where the only culpable mental state required for a crime charge is that the conduct be performed intentionally, any lesser included offense requiring a reckless mental state is a lesser included offense. If the only mental state required is recklessly, a lesser included offense could be criminally negligent mental state. Harassment is a lesser included offense of assault, attempted assault, and menacing. Possession of a controlled substance is a lesser included offense of a sale of controlled substance. The reason why I described the scenario in question eight the way I described it is because I want you to think of mental disease or defect as someone who did this type of thing. They snapped and they committed an offense, but they're not necessarily mentally ill. We need to find out if they are. When we get into Article 730, that's called fitness to proceed. That is a very different thing than what we're talking about here. After the indictment is filed, they all discuss AJ entering a plea of not responsible by reason of mental disease or defect. Now, the prosecutor can state these things orally or in writing filed with the court before the plea can be entered. So this is part of the prosecutor consenting we not only need the prosecutor's consent, we need the prosecutor to say all these things orally or in a writing, that the people are satisfied that the defense of lack of criminal responsibility by reason of mental disease or defect would be proven by the defendant at trial. The prosecutor must see in detail to the court all the evidence known to the people, including all psychiatric evidence. So that's something that's a little surprising, right? But no, that's but we have to have all the evidence seated by the prosecutor in detail, either in writing or orally on the record. The reasons for recommending the plea in detail and not conclusory terms, and all three of those things are needed from the prosecutor. The court's got to say a couple of other different things. So now, again, here's another study question, number nine. The entry and acceptance of a plea to one or more counts, but not all counts, of a multi-count indictment constitutes a disposition of the entire indictment. That's always true. So you cannot have a plea bargain where the DA is going to say, okay, I'm going to let you plead to this charge, but then I'm keeping this charge open and I'm going to try you on it. Not possible. With permission of the court and consent of the people, a plea of guilty to part of the indictment or to the entire indictment may be entered and accepted on the condition that it constitutes a complete disposition of one or more other indictments against the defendant. Where the defendant is a juvenile offender, a plea of guilty to any offense other than an offense the defendant is criminally responsible for may not be accepted on the condition that it constitutes a complete disposition of one or more other indictments against the defendant. And the reason for that is you can't have a juvenile offender with a bunch of different indictments all for felonies and then take a plea on something that they're not criminally responsible for and then all these other indictments are just going to go away because of that. Can't have that. They would all have to be removed to family court and then let family court adjudicate them or they are going to need to take a plea to something that they're criminally responsible for and then at that point you're looking at a different process. The case can still go to family court after a plea, but for the purpose of this section and this question, just remember that it may not be accepted if it's not a criminal, it's a plea that the juvenile offender is criminally responsible for. You can't get rid of other indictments that way. So if a defendant who is required to enter a plea refuses to do so or stands mute, the court must enter a plea of not guilty on their behalf. And that's why this was the answer, it's D, because it, there is no such thing as a no contest plea in New York. It's not guilty or guilty, those, or not responsible by reason of mental disease or defect, or a plea bargain where you plead to some of the charges and not others. Okay, so there's the big thing, remember about New York, there is no such thing as a no contest plea. They have that in other states, not here.
If the defendant and the prosecutor agree that a condition in the plea that certain property shall be forfeited by the defendant, the description and present estimated monetary value of the property shall be stated in court by the prosecutor at the time of the plea. 10. A plea of guilty not embracing the entire indictment is termed a plea of guilty to part of the indictment. Not very creative, but that's the end. That's what it's called. 11. Here's another study question, which is a false statement. So I'm going to read these as if they're true. A, the entry and acceptance of a plea of guilty to part of the indictment constitutes a disposition of the entire indictment. We already know that's true. It was in a previous question. E, a plea of guilty to an indictment may, with permission of the people and consent of the court. That's wrong because it's always consent of the people and permission of the court. So if it said that, it'd be correct. C, a plea of guilty may be entered and accepted on the condition that it constitutes a complete disposition of one or more pending other indictments, provided that if the other indictments are impending in different courts or multiple different courts, those courts and prosecutors must transmit their written permission and consent before such a plea can be accepted. That just makes sense. A plea of guilty for any crime other than a felony may not be accepted on the condition that it constitutes a complete disposition of one or more other indictments against the defendant wherein is charged a nonviolent class B felony. Now, um, that one, it's really important that you remember that we have a couple of different things for B felonies that they could ask. So for a B violent felony that's also an arms felony, where that's the one I want you to think of the forcible rape at gunpoint. If you have that crime, the best offered plea they can get on that indictment is a C violent felony. If you have a non-violent class B felony, they just have to take a plea to any felony and then it can dispose of that indictment and other indictments. And if you have a B violent felony, it must, but it's not an armed felony, then you have to take a plea to at least a class D violent felony. Okay, so if a, if a person is charged with a class B or class C violent felony offense, they can't get a disposition of other indictments unless they plead to at least a class D violent felony. So just like a B violent felony to get the plea on their original indictment, they got to take that same plea to at least a D violent felony on, on the indictment to get a disposition of other indictments. It's got to be at least a D violent because if they take a plea to a C violent that's more serious than a D violent so when you're asking about what's the best offer for this it's, it would be a D violent felony because of what it says there the lowest class that they list is D violent 12 Shannon has been recently indicted in Suffolk for multiple drug felonies in article 220 of the penal law including a class B felony so the best possible plea bargain can be a plea of guilty to any class D felony in full satisfaction of the recent indictment and the other indictments. So these pleas, these two pleas, A and B would be acceptable, but they're not the best option for her. They're not the best. So that's why the answer is C there. Um, so remember for a class B violent, you have to go to D violent, class B minimum uh, B, Regular, it's just a felony, but a B drug felony got to be at least a D felony. And all these things, do not go crazy with memorizing them. I'm just saying this so that if you're on the test, that maybe you hear my voice in your head and you're able to answer the question. But I would not go super crazy trying to memorize these. This one I would make sure I know this is an absolute layup question. If you get it, it's a gift. It's an easy time rule question. If the defendant and prosecutor agree that a condition of the plea that property will be forfeited, the description and estimated monetary value shall be stated in court by the prosecutor at the time of the plea. And then within 30 days of defendant's acceptance of the plea, the prosecutor shall send to DCJS a document containing the date the plea was accepted, the name and required demographic information of the defendant, a description and present monetary value of the property. Any property forfeited by the defendant as a condition of plea to an indictment or superior court shall be disposed of in accordance with CPLR 1349. So, which is proceeds of a crime forfeiture or something like that. Um, just know that if you see something talking about this and they're asking for the time rule, it's 30 days.
Okay, which of the following are true regarding pleas to indictments? A, a plea to an indictment against the corporation must be entered by counsel only. B, where a sentence is agreed upon by the prosecutor and the defendant as a predicate to entry of a guilty plea, the prosecutor must see the agreed upon sentence orally on the record as a condition of such plea, but it can also be in writing and the court can also do it. So that's why that was wrong. So C was answered, this one's actually true. A plea to an indictment that does not charge a felony may, with permission of the court, be entered by counsel upon written authorization of the defendant. So if it's the indictment charges a misdemeanor, the counsel can possibly take the plea. Okay, but it needs permission of the court. It doesn't have the right to just do that. D, there's no authorization necessary for counsel to, to um, enter a plea because they have to be represented by counsel. Prior to accepting a defendant's plea of guilty to felony, it has to be a felony only. So it should read like this for it to be true. Prior to accepting a defendant's plea of guilty to a felony, the court must advise the defendant on the record that conviction will result of the loss of the right to vote while defendant is serving and that it will be restored upon release. And so it's not for any crime, it's only for a felony that you lose it. Prior to trial and before accepting a plea from a public official to any felony, so here's another one that's any felony, the court must advise the defendant that at the time of the alleged offense, he was a public official. The plea of guilty may result in reduction or revocation of the defendant's pension pursuant to the Social Security law. So it's any felony, both for loss of right to vote while you're in jail, while you're in upstate prison, really. And also, if you're a public official and you're taking a plea to a felony, you could lose your pension. Those things have to be told to the defendant on the record when they're taking the plea by the court. A defendant who has entered a plea of guilty may, as a matter of right, withdraw the plea at any time before rendition of a verdict and enter a plea of guilty to the entire indictment, unless the indictment charges murder in the first degree. So this is very consistent. Just like you have the right to enter a plea of guilty to the entire indictment, you have the right to enter that, to withdraw your not guilty plea as a matter of right before the rendition of a verdict. So if you agree to enter a plea of guilty to the entire indictment, you have the right to enter that, to withdraw your not guilty plea as a matter of right before the rendition of a verdict. So if you agree to plead guilty to the entire indictment, the sentence then, it's between the judge and the defendant. The DA is out of it. The only time you need the DA consent or, and permission of, well, you need permission of the court because you're not gonna just take a plea and have no idea what the sentence is. But the idea is you have the right to just plead guilty. You have the right to withdraw your not guilty plea at any time before rendition of a verdict and plead guilty to the indictment. So when do you need consent of the people when you're talking about a plea bargain or a plea of mental disease or defect? Okay, 17, another study question. Which of the following are true regarding a change of plea? Everything here was true except for number six. Okay, so let's go over them. A defendant who has entered a plea of not guilty to an indictment may, with permission of the court and consent of the people, withdraw such plea at any time before rendition of a verdict and enter a plea of guilty to part of the indictment. And that's a plea bargain. So the difference is between the one that's a matter of right in question 16 and this one in question 17 is that one of them is pleading guilty to the entire indictment, which you have the right to do. And one is a plea bargain that there are, the DA is willing to dismiss some charges in satisfaction of you pleading guilty to some of the charges. Two, a defendant who has entered a plea of not guilty to an indictment may, with permission of the court and consent of the people, withdraw such plea at any time before rendition of a verdict and enter a plea of not responsible by reason of mental disease or defect. Three, at any time before the imposition of sentence, the court in its discretion may permit a defendant who has entered a plea of guilty to the entire indictment to withdraw such plea. And in such event, the entire indictment as it existed at the time of such plea is restored. So this is if, imagine this scenario, somebody takes a plea of guilty because they think this is the best is that they're ever gonna get. And then they get new information that actually helps prove someone else committed the crime. Now they go to the court with that information the court has the discretion to let them withdraw their plea and then the indictment is restored at any time before no so that's the difference is that you're talking about a plea of guilty now any time before the imposition of sentence 
Because one sentence is imposed, that's the conclusion of the criminal action. Okay, so that those two things, again, the DA is not involved. The DA does not have to consent to withdrawing um, their plea and taking it back. Okay, that's between the court and the defendant. Just like sentencing when you plead to the whole indictment. Five, at any time before the imposition of sentence, the court in its discretion may permit a defendant who entered a plea of guilty to part of the indictment to withdraw such plea. And in such event, entire indictment as it existed at the time of such plea is restored. So the reason that six is false is because the people may consent to just drop it. Seven, if a defendant enters a plea of guilty for which the prosecutor filed a special information, the defendant must admit to the allegations or the prosecutor consents otherwise, or the court must hold a hearing. <laughs> so that's why seven was right and six was wrong. Obviously you couldn't have both of those correct.